birth order is important because it describes a person's early environment. Although each family is different, Adler found that people's attitudes about their family often fit in predictable patterns. For example, only children often feel like they have no one to rely on. Their parents may be more anxious than those with several children, so an only child might receive special care. He might be pampered or given nervous or anxious attention. Of course, the firstborn child was an only child before being dethroned. Because of the change in status, the firstborn might battle for position by becoming precocious, sullen, or rebellious. As you can see, the theory doesn't predict very well. If there are three possible outcomes to a single condition, you're not much better off than saying you have no idea what a firstborn child will do. But Adler didn't worry about predictions. He was more concerned with attitude. If a firstborn acts like a secondborn, it makes a little difference for Adler's purposes. He was looking for a gate to discover attitudes, whatever the attitude is. The second gate is early memories. What's your earliest memory? If it involves aggression, you might still be battling for position in your family of origin. If your earliest memory is about hiding, perhaps you feel neglected or inferior. For Adler, these early memories help reveal the underlying themes. So early memories were important to Adler because they reflect a person's fundamental view of life. He thought of it as a crystallization of attitude. Adler isn't alone in his interest in early memories. Freud proposed people have infantile amnesia. They repress their early memories because of their sexual nature. Although modern theories of memory don't support such interpretations, there are still many people who believe this doctrine. The third gate is dreams. Before modern neurological explanations were available, people believed that dreams reveal inner psychic secrets. In classical Freudian psychoanalysis, people are thought to be pushed by instincts and drives. And dreams were a way to get a glimpse of these unconscious processes. Now this concern is discovering your style of life. As a reflection of your inner life and goals, it doesn't matter if they are real dreams or fantasies. If you can't remember your dreams, your daydreams, imagination, and fantasies will do. So that's the last video I'm going to show you in this chapter, but once again, I kind of think it's important that you get an understanding of Adler, because really in this whole notion of child guidance, some of the stuff that, he, that, that was spoken about by him is important, and we talked about the mistaken goals. Let's look at these. So children try to make themselves the center of attention at all times. So the adult either is going to give in or they're going to scold them. So what you need to do as a teacher to provide, as, as we talked about in this class, positive guidance. Positive guidance happens when you're able to help them join the group appropriately and tell them to continue working on what they were doing. That's what a good teacher does in that case. So power. Children will always try to show you that they're in charge. Um, the adults drawn into a power struggle, and this really has to do with that kind of indulgent stuff we spoke about in chapter one. So the adult has to refuse to argue and set firm, consistent goals. I know I'm referencing South Park, but if you watch South Park, you need to think about the relationship that Eric Cartman has with his mother. It's the perfect example of this. I would show a clip of, of uh, the, the dog whisper episode of South Park if I was doing this in a face-to-face -face class, because that's the kind of power struggle that children are smart enough to have with adults when they can. So children, if they don't get what they want, will seek vengeance, and they will. They'll complain, they'll throw a fit, that they'll start to break things. But you have to help a child manage anger and anxiety. It's not bad if a child feels this way. It's really not. You might think it is, but trust me, it's not. You just have to teach them how to manage it in an appropriate venue. So sometimes children do display incompetence. And really, sometimes children aren't capable of doing what they need to be doing. Just understand that. Children don't 100% have the capabilities that, you know, that, that, that they need to have at certain ages, but that'll make them feel incompetent. The child, the child will get frustrated, will quit completing work, and the teacher has to provide scaffolding where necessary. So this goes back to Vygotsky, and a smart teacher can give them positive guidance but can help them on words or concepts in which they struggle in, and that's important. So, iMessages. iMessages are another thing that our textbook is going to speak about a lot. You're going to see these a lot in the later chapters. These are statements that adult gives, will give to children to show them what they did incorrectly and correctly. And it's empowering for an adult, and it should be simple and a statement of fact. 
You have observable data, you state the tangible effects, you say how you felt, and you focus on change. So let me give you an example of what an I message should look like. It should say something like, I noticed that you didn't turn in your homework yesterday in class. That's tangible. You didn't turn your homework in yesterday in class. This would be even better if you said, you didn't turn your homework in at the beginning of the class in the box by the door at the entrance like all the other students did. This has an impact on your grade for the class. This is the consequence. The fact that you didn't turn in your assignment, I felt sad. How you felt about I feel. What can we do together, you and I, to make sure it doesn't happen again? Good teachers talk like this. Good teachers will give praise to a student who's sitting appropriately on the floor. I like the way Ashley got out, out of her seat, pushed her chair, and sat down on the floor crisscross applesauce. Child did what the teacher wanted to do, then everybody else will model what Ashley does. So we, have fin we finally can end with the concept of social learning theory. This is the last one that we're going to be looking at, specifically if it's theoretical. This is basically saying that there are seven different principles um, to learning and how they relate to the child's environment. This slide gives you a list of them, but guess what? We're gonna, you know, we're gonna go over each one of these. So here's the list so you have it in front of you, but we're gonna go over each one of these and that'll be the end of this chapter. So Bandura was different than Piaget. Bandura said, I don't accept hierarchy of needs and I don't accept Piaget stages. He believed that everything was situational and it was the external environment that really determined what happened. So how the social environment looked and how, you know, basically the Bronfenbrenner theory interacted too, how the child interacted with the environment, whether it's peers, whether it's actual environmental concerns. So kids learn and their behavior is shaped on their environment. If a child is in Spanish, but they're thrown in with a Spanish family, they learn how to speak Spanish. Doesn't matter if they're Spanish or not. Same respect, if we were to take a child from if we were to take a child from Vietnam and put them in the United States, they wouldn't know Vietnamese if they were born and raised by American parents. So the environment determines how learning occurs. Modeling is everything. This is the big idea. If you have one big idea from Bandora that he's known of, that he's known for, it's this principle three, this modeling. Children learn from watching people, movies, television, video games, and it encourages and helps them to build who they are as a person. Biggest assignment in this class, it's not the research paper, is the fact that you're going to have to watch children's television. I want you to watch a two-hour show, one-hour show, um, and two half-hour shows, and then a special. Five different programs. I want you to invest, you know, six hours, six to seven hours of time in watching children's television. I want you to see what they're exposed to based on the show, what are they exposed to based on the characters, and how does that modeling influence the child's learning. So children, if something's complex for a child, they chunk it, they, in, 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 instead of learning it in tiny steps. They get to a point where they can't stay it anymore, then they'll keep trying it again, and then eventually they'll have better opportunities to demonstrate behavior. So some people say that children's behavior can be changed radically, radically over a quick amount of time instead of gradually changing behavior. I think this is also up for interpretation. If a child's social environment is changed, behavior is changed. This is the Fresh Prince theory. Fresh Prince struggled, Philadelphia, sent to Bel Air. Did he change? Did the social environment change? Did the behavior change? Well, the show would want you to believe, yes, that's what occurred. So if you can change the child's environment and their social environment, it's going to have a long-term impact on kids. This is why there are arguments made that adults should interfere and facilitate children's friendships at a young age. Some of you may disagree. I kind of disagree with that. How are schools doing this right now? Well, schools aren't changing who kids interact with, but they're changing grade level configurations. The big key that you're going to see throughout the United States are two school building arrangement types, and you're already seeing them now. Schools are switching to a 5-6 building. It isolates upper elementary children from influencing younger kids. That's why they're doing it. They're also switching to a ninth grade academy, thinking if we can isolate all the ninth graders together and keep all the ninth grade issues in one, by the time they're up to high school in 10th grade, they're a year older, and then they can deal and interact with seniors on a more apt basis. Principle six, children learn what to do. Basically, 
you know, just by watching without reinforcement. So maybe not through praise, maybe not through negativity, but children watching, doing what somebody else is doing will teach them how to behave. Children learn how to swear by watching other people swear. Parents, television shows, maybe video games, that's how kids learn how to swear. So principle seven, children also learn reinforcement from other children. This is why in some cases, it's almost not a bad idea for a teacher to tell a child what they did wrong outside of class. What I always try to do, and I can't turn my camera else I would do this, but I would basically mimic a situation in a face-to-face -face class where I make sure the child is behind the door so the kids can't see the child, but I'm standing out in the doorway in view of the kids and I'm talking to the child quietly so the other kids can't hear telling them what the child did wrong. The other children are smart enough to see something's going on, and they're seeing me display authority. By doing that, children are learning reinforcement, and it gives them information from what happens to the other children. So that's it for this chapter. This is the longest chapter in the entire class. This is the longest video in the entire class. Even though this is heavy on content, I want, wanted this chapter to give you some ideas of topics that you should cover on your research paper. We're going to move on and we're going to look at some of the other chapters. If there's anything else that I can do to help you related to this chapter, please let me know. Take some time and go back over this a few times. Thank you.